In this segment, we're going to talk about the sort of overall conceptual framework that we're going to think about when we talk about MT. So the, the kind of way I want to diagram this uh, is a very useful diagram due to Bernard Vauquois uh, from the 1960s. So like I said, people have been thinking about translation for a long time. And uh, the diagram is called the Vauquois triangle. Uh, so, the idea is roughly the following. We have a source sentence over here and a target sentence over here, more or less represented as strings of words. And so, we could think about a kind of word level method for translating between these two things. That's like the closest to the surface structure of these sentences, uh, the kind of lowest level form of translation we can think of. We can also think about some kind of phrase level translation. So we're drawing this further up the triangle because this is at a like higher level of, let's say, linguistic abstraction. All right, the kind of next level up here is what we'll call syntactic. Um, so rather than thinking about the language in terms of phrases, we think about it in terms of bigger syntactic structures. And so what we're trying to do is transform a syntactic analysis, like a, for example, a dependency or constituency tree in one language into the other language. And then the kind of layer above that is the semantic layer. So here we think about maybe we want to have some sort of un understanding of the semantics of a uh, uh, you know of an utterance and use that to achieve this mapping. Um, so, for example, we could think about the kind of lambda calculus expressions we saw when we talked about question answering and semantic parsing. Um, and so, if you have a lambda calculus expression that actually grounds the meaning of a sentence in a database query or something like that, we could think about what sentences in another language would have a similar kind of grounding. And then at the top, we have uh, what's called interlingua. And this is largely a kind of abstract concept. And the basic idea is that, uh, you know, if we have a French sentence, we could map it into some kind of blob that captures the meaning of that sentence in some sort of language independent way, right? And then we should be able to convert that blob or sort of generate from that blob into English or Japanese or uh, kind of whatever language you want to translate into. Okay, so this is a great kind of concept and framework for thinking about things. Um, the problem is that sort of high up on this triangle is actually going to be pretty hard to uh, kind of pretty hard to deal with in a lot of ways. So when we think about, uh, for example, you know what what this meaning actually has to capture, there's a lot of decisions that we uh, that we have to make, and we would rather like to avoid making them. Um, so, for example, uh, French and English use gender in different ways. Um, so, in English, if you talk about uh, her cousin, you know, we know the gender of the person who uh, is related to the cousin, but we don't know the gender of the cousin. But in French, if we talk about her cousin, we don't know the gender of the person who has the cousin, but we do know the cousin's gender, right? And so in order to capture this actual abstract meaning, we need to kind of nail both of these things down. And sometimes that requires making really tough decisions or inferring things from context that we otherwise don't need to infer. So these, these kind of upper layers here are pretty hard to deal with. And so the kind of history of machine translation is that uh, you know, roughly I'll say that word level stuff was kind of popular initially, um, especially a lot of the early work at IBM on statistical translation really did operate at the word level. And then phrases were really the kind of dominant paradigm from 
uh, you know, roughly 2000 to roughly 2015 when neural machine translation started really taking over. And syntax, a kind of syntactic level is also tough. Uh, this was an approach that people thought was very promising for a long time and put a lot of work into it. And we're going to see what some of those techniques look like and understand a little bit about what makes it so hard. Um, but phrases are really kind of the sweet spot, it turns out, uh, in terms of thinking about, all right, like, we, we want to stay close to the words because that's easy from a just computational machine learning modeling perspective, uh, but we want to do a little bit better than trying to do word-by-word -word translation because those units are too small. So the, the basic idea is that Big chunks make translation easier. And the kind of way, one way to illustrate this is just imagine that you have a whole sentence given to you and you've seen that whole sentence in your training data. You know, you should just return the translation that someone gave you before, right? I mean, unless there's something in the context that tells you you should do something different, like that's a very good baseline. And then imagine if you have a sentence someone gives you that's just, you know, two clauses that you've each seen before. Now you would want to translate clause one, translate clause two. That's probably going to be pretty good. Again, there could be some errors in there, but uh, it's a very strong baseline. So the questions we need to answer are how do we get these chunks? And then how do we translate? So the question of getting chunks is going to require us to answer the problem of how we learn these correspondences between uh, two different languages. And then we'll also talk about how we can then plug that into an actual translation system uh, kind of downstream. The thing I want to talk about first, which ties into the uh, triangle that we saw here, is the idea of evaluation. It turns out that, eval that it sort of is pretty convenient to evaluate MT at the word slash phrase level. So people have been working on MT for a long time, and so there are a lot of metrics, and uh, people have whole competitions about coming up with better metrics that correlate better with human judgments of translation. So there's a whole really rich literature on this, and I'm going to tell you about one thing, which is kind of the lowest common denominator here, um, and that's a metric called blue. Um, and so blue is a metric that is defined as follows is the geometric mean of one gram, two gram, three gram, and four gram precision of, of the output, plus, well, I guess it, it also includes, uh, let me say, times a brevity penalty. All right, so kind of in the abstract, we have a uh, we have a reference translation that someone gives us, and then we produce a translation from our system. And we say, okay, for four gram precision, what we're asking is how many four grams are in the reference? And so when I say this is a mix of word and phrase level, you can kind of see that we're assessing this translation in terms of these individual phrasal chunks. Um, and then we have a geometric mean across these different precisions. 
And then we also have what's called a brevity penalty, which I'm not gonna go into too much, but basically it penalizes translations which are too short. Otherwise, what you could do is you could just output, let's say four words you were very confident about um, and get, you know, and if that, if that four gram was correct, you would get 100% precision, but you wouldn't have translated most of the reference. So what this does is it, you know, it just sort of slides a window through this translation and checks it against the reference. Now, what this doesn't handle is ambiguity. You could do that a little bit by having multiple references, kind of multiple valid translations that someone's written down. Um, and people do have that on some of the test sets that they use. Um, but generally what happens is that blue scores are low. Uh, and when I say low, I mean that, you know, 30 to 40 might be an extremely good blue score. It might even be human level translation quality just because there are true differences in how, you in, in how you're able to translate things, right? So what we, could, what, we, what we sort of know and have come to understand is that blue correlates pretty well with human judgments of translation quality, but it's not really an absolute scale. Like we can't look at a blue score of 30 and say this is somehow 30% correct. Uh, instead, it's something where we know that blue of 33 is probably quite a bit better than blue of 30. And, you know, when developing a system on a single language, we can use this as our kind of benchmark for understanding how well we're doing. Now, what, what it also can't do is allow us to compare performance across different languages or across different test sets easily. Because if you have different numbers of references or if the sentences are more or less complicated, it's very hard to calibrate these scores. Regardless, this is still a useful tool that's really powered the last, uh, you know, tools like this have powered the last 15 to 20 years of translation research. And it's a very common metric that you'll see. And so it's good to understand it. So, we kind of understand now that if we are able to translate a bunch of phrasal chunks fairly accurately, we might do a good job on this metric and that will ideally let us produce things that look good to humans as well. So the question that we're gonna answer going forward is how do we get the kind of phrase level correspondences that we're looking for and then how do we use those in an actual translation system? That's the end of this segment.